half the time. Yeah, I was going to say, so they split it, would you split half and half? Right, right. Okay. You would do your duties in the clinic as the flight surgeon in the squadron. And did that for a few years, and then, uh, A, you know, I got restless, so I applied for ophthalmology and at Bethesda, and I got selected, and they sent me up there for three more years of fairly, you know, a lot of work. And then, so, so through the Navy again, uh, so all this time? Look, I mean, I want to back up. I mean, the, other than being, a, I don't want to say any bad words, but other than being a hay seat from the Midwest, <laughs> everything I know how to do is in my adult life, other than drive a tractor, yes. dump a garbage can, I learned in the Navy. That's awesome. Everything. That's awesome. And so then that played out with that, and that I was in charge of a few things, and all of a sudden, my initial idea was to be in the military for three years, and it turned into almost 30, because there was always an adventure, there was always something to do, right. there was always education, experiences, I've traveled all over the world, I've crawled through the jungles of Laos on my stomach, I've been on aircraft carriers, and it's great stuff. You love it. Now, how did all of that translate to where you are now with the FAA, and you're also with Stallion 51, so where, where was the transition? Well, the transition started way back when, probably around 1989 or 90, when I met Lee Lauderback and Doug Schultz with their crazy horse P-51, and I believe in an air show in uh, Daytona Beach. Or Which, yeah, you're wearing this shirt. Exactly. So, I see it. So, for the, next, uh, let's see, that for the next 15 years or so, we were in contact, and we talked about what we could do after I got out of the Navy, whenever I did. Okay. And so they waited, and I eventually retired and came down here, and we opened up a shop, uh, an aviation medicine clinic right in the Stallion 51 complex, where we do everything. And so uh, I run that, and I you know, fly a little bit, and I own aircraft. In fact, I own a T-28 myself right now. You know, I figured, having been the first aircraft I flew, I decided I might as well own one for a while. That's so awesome. I own a T-28. But anyway... Came down the Stallion 51, we opened up the, uh, the uh, medical clinic. Okay. Of course, it's sort of an eye clinic, too, because I'm an ophthalmologist, and we do all forms of uh, aviation medicine. We do class one, two, three. Awesome. Uh, we do the HIMSS program, which is the drug and alcohol program, okay. mental health program, and we basically solve pilots' problems. That's what we do. Now, did you, I want to ask you, um, let, me, let me talk to you a little bit, because obviously, the medical for safety, um, and it, it fits what you did with ophthalmology, your medical background fits, because safety first starts with pilots, and that means that we have to be in the best shape that we can possibly be in. Talk a little bit about how someone that's interested in flying really gets the FAA to say yes. What are some of the things, can you talk to us a little bit about what the exam, I know we've talked to this many times, but we've got new viewers. What does that exam entail? What are you looking for as a chief medical examiner? What are you looking for in your pilots? Well, first of all, there's three different classes. There's okay. class one, which in the big picture is for airline pilots. Okay. Class two is for commercial pilots, corporate level, air show pilots, guys that give aerial tours. Okay. That's anytime you're uh, paid for your services, that's class two. Gotcha. Class three is everybody else. Okay. That's nothing to do with what type of airplane you fly. Okay. And then there's different standards based on your age in addition to what class you apply for. Okay. Okay. Generally speaking, if my audience is the student pilots and all the young people around here, right. generally speaking, they're in pretty good shape. They don't have much to worry about. Right. The older you get, those things pop up. Things <laughs> pop up. So we can talk about that in a I second. I resemble that remark. <laughs> The standards are more strict depending on how high the class you go. So the class one is okay. more restrictive than the class three. Okay. Okay. Um, what was the rest of the question? I was just going to ask. So for the student pilots, where would they would start with the general? The, well, the, you can apply for any any your class you want. Okay. I, I, uh, what I do is I recommend the student pilots, if they're going to go on and try to do some professional endeavors in aviation, I recommend that they get the class one right out of the gate to make sure they can pass it. Because they can. Okay. And it's really almost everybody that's 20 years old is going to pass. Okay. Unless you have some of the specific disqualifying conditions. Okay. I mean, they're too young to really have a big a big uh, percentage of high blood pressure, diabetes, got all these things. Are those you usually what you see as the disqualifiers in that class? Well, they're not. They're only slightly disqualified because you can get a waiver for all of those. I got But you. they are the most common things we see. Okay. 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 So the young people have it pretty good in that category. Uh, other than that, um, 
how often do they have to renew? Okay. So depending on the class, so how yeah. often does someone have to renew their physical? If you're under 40, okay. you get a medical certificate from an AME, which is also a flight surgeon. AME means Aviation Medical Examiner. That's what the FAA calls a flight surgeon. That's you. The military calls you a flight surgeon, so I may use them interchangeably. Okay, okay, thank so you. So if you go to get a medical certificate for flying, whether it's one, two, or three, if you're under 40 years old, that medical certificate is good for five years. Okay, all right. So every five years they would have to come back to you? Not necessarily. Okay. Now, if they're a young airline pilot, they have to have a class one. Right. If you're under 40, you get a class one, it's good for five total years, but only one year is a first class. Then it goes to third class for four more years. Oh. Okay, so that's something they need to know. If, you get a, if you're under 40 and you get a second class, it's good for one year as a second class and four more years as a third class. If you get a third class and you're under 40, it's good for five years. So they're all good for a total of five years. But so the first and second are only good for one year. Okay. Okay. If you're over 40, it's two years total. Two years total. Okay. So if you're 40 to 90 or 100, it's right. two years. And they, that does not drop. So it's not just a year and then it drops down. Well, it can. If you're over 40 and you get a class one. Okay. It's a little bit complicated. I wouldn't, we don't want to get too far into weeds on That's this. But right. if you're over 40 and you're an airline pilot and you get a class one, it's good for six months as a class one. Then it's good for six months as a class two. That's good for 12 more months as a class three for a total of two years. I got you. Awesome. How do, what do you recommend? And let's, I like how you group, thank you for helping me understand and putting people in basically in the age care categories. So really for our students, for instance, the students at CFAA, the students that we, we would see around here at Sun and Fun, they're under 20. Is there Talk about anything specific they need to do to really get ready so that the FAA will say yes. But then can you talk a little bit about that group that may be between 20 and 40? And those individuals like myself that are well over 40 into our 50s, what would we need to do to really prepare to get ourselves ready to fly? This is a long, uh, this has a long answer. Okay, uh, that's all right. Generally speaking, generally speaking, if you're a young student, 20-ish, whatever, okay. you don't really need to do much because if you have a disqualifying condition, which we can talk about in a second, right. but generally speaking, you're going to be in good enough shape. I mean, the whole idea about the medical exam is it's a physical exam to see if you pass physically by the FAA standards, okay? Okay. Well, most 20-year-olds are a little more active than 90-year-olds, okay? So that's where you come in to have the advantage. Right. But what I'm going to throw out here right now is how you can get yourself in trouble at whatever age. Please. And that's with drugs, alcohol, and mental health issues. If you have any of those, then the FAA is going to draw a line on the sand, and we're going to have to do a lot of ciphering and a lot of negotiating to get you a medical. So my, my, uh, my message to the young people is, Keep yourself clean in those categories. Don't get in trouble with alcohol, drugs. If you have a mental health issue going on, search out counseling before your family practice doctor, I hate to say it, gives you an antidepressant or something. Search out counseling before you're given the diagnosis because you may not really have the diagnosis. Once you have a diagnosis of mental, a mental health issue, PTSD, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, ADHD, any of those things, that's going to be an issue with the FAA because they do not like mental health issues. Those are dangerous in aviation, just like certain other conditions. Right. So to the young people, again, DUI, bad, 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 don't drink and drive, you know, the whole story is I right. can repeat it five times. And you know what, I wanted to go back, while you're, while you're talking about that, so we're talking about this young group and some of the things that they need to do, specifically, as you said, they're active, they're healthy, they're going to generally pass their exam as long as they stay away from alcohol, drugs, and health issues. Mental, you, health, mental issues. health issues. You talked about HEMS and that program. I am unfamiliar with that. Can you, would you speak to that? That's, Just bring one, of that made a That's one of the programs we have, and there's not very many AMEs or flight surgeons that do that nationwide. I mean, it's a much smaller group. It's a specialty. It's a subspecialty of FAA aviation medicine practice. Okay. It's called HIMS, H-I-M-S. Okay. And that's the drug and alcohol program and mental health program. So what does the acronym stand for? It stands for Human Intervention and Motivation Study. 
it's a government thing, and you, I don't know why they named it that, but okay. that's what they did. Okay. This is a program that was started by the airlines many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, to salvage the careers of alcoholic airline pilots. You know, like in the movies? Yes. Like, was that movie? Flight. Flight. Yes. Yeah, like yes. salvage their careers. And it's, it's been propagated over those years, and now the FAA has adopted it maybe 15 years ago. Like my, my years are probably wrong, but a while ago. Okay. So now it's, it's, a, it's an FAA and airline pilot, airline company sponsored program where you help people that have drinking and, and drug problems. Okay. And it's now bled over into a little bit of the mental health thing. Okay. Okay, but basically this program now is run through the FAA. Okay. And it is the, is the focus and the mission to keep the pilots in the air to deal with those issues and keep them in the air because I know yes. we've got a shortage. Well, it's, it's focused to do that, but it's very restrictive. And the point is, it's definitely better not to be in the HIMSS program than, than to be in the HIMSS program. However, if you have a problem, this is the way where you can keep your ticket and keep flying. But there's a lot to do. I mean, you're right. monitored and you have to, right. there's a whole string of things to do. I mean, if you want to get into that, that's a whole lecture in itself. Right. The point is, the point is for the young people that are out there in school, in college, in training, don't get in trouble. Is it right? Stay away. Otherwise, that could haunt you for many years and cause you a lot of irritating effort. And it could enough. cause your career. Because they could cause your career. Now, the next group, let's talk about that group that's the middle age group. Um, that would be in, that are interested in aviation. Maybe they want to do it, um, let's say, as a sport or as a hobby. This is the what um, age group. What, um, what would they, now what would they have to look for? What would they have to do to be oh, a ready talking about most middle age, 30 to 60. Well, let's say 30 to 60. I think it's 30 to 70. Okay, I like that. Okay. That uh, works for me. It's basically about preventative medicine and, and, and being in the best shape you can. Okay. Uh, the problem with, the, not the problem, what happens in those age ranges is people get lazy, they don't exercise, they don't eat right, and then they start acquiring these issues that happen because you don't have a healthy lifestyle. Smoking too much, drinking too much, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, these sort of things come up in those years. Okay. So you want to maintain your height to weight, you want to maintain a good healthy diet, exercise profile and all that. So it's a general health thing. It's not like there's anything special about it. Right. General health. And then if you want to go into the flying thing, most people that are up in those years, they don't go into, into aviation to be a professional pilot. Right. Usually that's kind of pass that up. Right. But they may go into it for hobby flying or for business flying, recreational flying. Right. You know, I mean, I change, I, that's different than hobby flying. Recreation is more like you're going to take your family on trips. Okay. Stuff like that. Uh, the advice I can give them is be in good shape and then when you come to do your medical exam with your flight surgeon, make sure you are exactly honest with him and fill out the paperwork correct. In other words, don't forget to put any of your conditions on there because or the, any medicine you take, make sure you are very complete in all that. If you have any questions before you fill that document out, that FAA form 8500-8, which you access through the medexpress.faa.gov website. Okay, so could you say that again? So it's 8500-8, 80, and where can they find it? need to know that part. They need to know the medexpress. Okay. Dot FAA dot gov. Good, okay. And that's medexpress, but it's not EX, it's med. Express. Got it. Perfect. And you can find that, but be perfectly honest on that, because what happens occasionally is if somebody's not honest, then that condition may creep up in a worse condition later on, and then they got some explaining to do because they haven't coughed it up five or ten years prior, right? And, the other, say, Matt, I love and that. then the other thing is if they have a mishap, right? And then it's found out that they weren't coming clean on their medical and given all the information. Then they got more explaining to do, and then they're, they have to explain that to the insurance company who may not cover them now. So it's bad not to do that. Okay. It's bad not to cough up all of She keeps saying cough up. That's not to put all of your pure, your true history on the form. Awesome. Now, let me ask you, you mentioned earlier, and I want to talk about this, especially for, as you said, the recreational flying, the hobby flying, different, you've educated me. Um, what are, you mentioned earlier about disqualifiers, that there are certain things that will disqualify, and I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to ask, are there any, um, like if you were on basic medications, are those acceptable? Are, 
what are some of okay, the well, things that you look for as a medical examiner that would be a big just no-go? Here's the thing. There's not that many total disqualifiers. Okay. Uh, unknown loss of consciousness, seizures, bad diseases, heart diseases, bad stuff. Common sense. Almost everything else, that's why I, I urge you to put the truth about your medical history on there and the medicine, because almost everything else can come under the special issuance program, which is the FAA's word for saying waiver. Gotcha. Okay. A waiver means an exception to policy. And the waiver means that you have a you have a rule, but you're going to get a waiver to get past that rule. So almost everything falls under that. All those things that I mentioned previously can fall under that, and you can still get a medical. What happens is you apply with a condition. Let's pick something. How about how about type two diabetes? Very common. Right. That means oral treated diabetes. Right. Very common. You can't fly with diabetes, but you can get a waiver or what they call a special issuance for that diabetes. And then we apply, and then eventually you'll get it under control, and they'll, they'll sell you, send you some paperwork, and they'll give you something to do so many times, so you, you know, once a year, or once every six months, to keep that going. So you will be what's on a, you'll be on a waiver, an exception to policy. Very common, and over 95% of the people that apply for those special issuances are granted. So it's no reason to be afraid of the special issuance process. And Dr. Bush, I want you to know it truly is an honor, and I thank you every time I speak to you. I learn something. Uh, you, you are a teacher's teacher and a true educator. Not only are you a doctor, but thank you for that. Um, and I know in Greek it means educator, and that you truly are. And I do, and I thank you for that. I, I want you to know, for those of you out there, you can actually go see Dr. Bush. I know that he did lectures. We did not get to speak about what he did earlier. But I know that you can see him. He will be at Stallion 51 at the Mustang Corral. So those of you that have any questions, please go see him today. My name is Lori Bradner. I'm with Florida Aviation Network. We are broadcasting live and in the clear from Sun and Fun 2021. Thank you, Dr. Bush. We appreciate you being here.